Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Poverty Narrative Series, dedicated to a deeper understanding of poverty in the United States and especially the Midwest. I'm Luke Schaefer, the Faculty Director of Poverty Solutions and a professor at the University of Michigan, uh, broadcasting from my basement. Our goal over the course of this series is to promote in-depth, impactful, and solutions-oriented coverage of poverty-related issues. We're going to be broadcasting live every Tuesday and Thursday in June at noon. If you missed any uh, the one previous session that we've had, it's gonna, it's available on our website, poverty.umich.edu. The series is supported by the Midwest Mobility from Poverty Network and with generous support from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We had an amazing session last Thursday. Uh, we're up to 1,100 viewers uh, with Derek Hamilton, Sarah Alvarez, Zoe Greenberg, and Bill Nichols. It was on the poverty narrative. We talked about how the, the poverty frame, just thinking about things in terms of poverty, is probably too small with everything that has happened in the last weeks and the past months. We talked about how poverty research should be investigative research, that often we don't know the right questions to ask. And the things that usually fit into our understandings and our um, assumptions about poverty are not often the things that people are really grappling with. In that investigative work, we want to know why something is happening. Looking back to the long arc of history and what has put up together the circumstances that led to what we see on the ground and what we should do about it. What are the solutions? I'm really excited about today's session, how to tell a story with data. Uh, those of you who know me know that I'm a data nerd. Uh, charts, a beautiful chart makes me feel warm and cuddly inside. And you might have heard the saying that numbers tell a story. When is that true? And how do we really harness the power of data to bring about change, to really deepen people's understanding about an important issue? Before we dig into the conversation, I want to remind viewers that we want to hear from you. You can submit questions in the comment box to the right on YouTube or on Twitter using the hashtag poverty narrative. We look forward to having a meaningful conversation and we'll try to get as many questions in as possible. We welcome an open and respectful dialogue. We wanna let folks know we're gonna be responsive to any appropriate, inappropriate content. I'm thrilled to be joined by two expert journalists who really understand the power of data and storytelling. Emily Badger mm -hmm. writes about city and urban policy for the New York Times, The Upshot, from the Washington Bureau. She's particularly interested in housing, transportation, and inequality, and how they're all connected. And Scott Levin has been a journalist for more than 20 years and now reports and creates interactive content with a focus on data to tell stories for MLive.com, my own hometown paper. Emily and Scott, thank you so much for being here. Thank Thanks you. for having this conversation. As we've seen with the coronavirus pandemic, effective integration of data and storytelling can have negative and positive consequences. So we wanted to just really invite both of you to talk a little bit about how data can help us better understand complicated stories of poverty and inequality and how they fit together. So Scott, I'm gonna to turn to you and, and I know you do a ton of work creating interactive maps and databases and dashboards. So tell us the story of of when those types of stories you found to be really effective at visualizing something that's going on and, and when can they be ineffective? Okay, sure. Um, so I'm sharing my screen now with a couple examples. Um, and I'm, it's fortunate for me that you uh, decided that the uh, poverty storyline might be a little narrow because although I have worked on some uh, mapping and charts of related to poverty in Michigan, uh, it's been a couple of years and they're pretty broad. We haven't dug really deeply into it in an investigative series, although that is on the uh, table. But uh, most recently, I thought I'd go through a few things uh, that I've been working on. Um, and if, if you've been to them live, you've probably seen this, especially if you're interested in coronavirus. Um, and so on my screen now, it's essentially uh, stacks of charts and uh, interactive uh, data projects that I've done since the very first case in uh, mid-March, early March. And right now, one example that seems to uh, resonate, especially at the beginning, the beginning was this map right here. Um, and this is essentially what the Michigan Department of Human Health and Services reported every day by county, a cumulative number of uh, 
coronavirus cases, or positive tests, excuse me. Now, um, as I said in the beginning, this was extremely uh, interesting to people. It showed where the cases were he most heavily uh, originated and how the spread occurred. In fact, at the bottom of this page, um, I did two sets of videos, uh, the first four weeks and the fourth to eighth week of uh, the spread. And that gives you the context of time over time. What this map didn't do, and um, I was well aware of it at the time, but was working with the data that the Michigan, uh, state of Michigan was providing, was give real context on both uh, per capita, which was interesting, but uh, population density also being interesting, but mostly the way to effectively get to this data would be per tests. So right here, I, uh, you can see that Detroit has uh, over 21,000 total confirmed cases and 2,500 deaths, that's as of yesterday. Um, but the real question is, is what is the percentage of uh, cases found over the total testing? Uh, at the time, it was pretty obvious that Southeastern uh, Michigan was getting the bulk of the tests at the beginning because that's where the spread was being uh, located and also uh, where hospitals were having trouble. But ultimately, what this test, what this map sort of fails at telling you is the real severity of the coronavirus presence in the state, in your county because we didn't have total testing data. So um, we still publish this map, it's still important for people to know, but it does have its limitations and I was well aware of that. And ultimately what, what became, um, let's track the coronavirus spread in Michigan sort of shifted a little bit to what is the data the state of Michigan is using to make policy decisions regarding lockdowns and closures. And so, in a, so the map was there. That's the data that part of the data they were working on. But they also were we also to the right where my my, my cursor is now hovered is a statewide reported uh, positive test per day. Uh, this is all of Michigan. We did not have the uh, data per day by county. I had to actually take each cumulative amount and calculate it, which uh, led to other issues that I'll get into later. But um, and so ultimately, as everybody I assume knows or has been following coronavirus, the spread or the uh, impact of coronavirus is based on the trend of how many cases are being discovered on a daily basis. And as you can see here, there's a lot of dips and a lot of gaps. That is because of the weekend. Um, the reporting was, I don't, they, you know, a couple of days, especially uh, May 15th, uh, excuse me, May 14th, they said that there was a backlog and they spiked it. But ultimately, the volume of reports coming in on a daily basis was not uniform. And what the problem with that is that people were hanging on this data every day to see if they're going to be able to come out. Uh, today, is it less than yesterday? Well, then that means we're on our way out. And so what we did is implement our own uh, moving average. And that is a actually a relatively uh, standard, excuse me, uh, practice in epidemiology. Um, and this is ultimately the curve that people should be looking at. Now, I couldn't have had that data if I didn't, you know, every day collect their cumulative amounts, do the subtraction, and then calculate the average. But that is ultimately what people need to uh, look at if they want to know how uh, serious is the spread or is coronavirus in our state. Um, now, in the beginning, we did this, this graph down here, which is this is all current, um, was the cumulative amount. And, of course, the cumulative amount is going to go up. And we got a lot of reader feedback saying, of course, it's going to go up. It's a cumulative. Uh, the concept was to calculate the, the spread of the curve. Um, and now I don't want to get too far into it. This is deaths, which is also an important uh, uh, measurement because this is test uh, irrelevant. It's if you died with coronavirus, uh, that's this is the data. And if the spike was in the reverse, where it was up here much higher, that would be a, a serious issue. Um, right down here, and this is, I'm just burning through this just to give you guys an idea of the kind of data that we were given. This is ultimately the best graph, the best chart, in my opinion, uh, for charting uh, coronavirus because it is total tests um, and then the positive, the percentage of positive out of those total. This is statewide as well. So this right here is the best. Unfortunately, I can't map that because they were doing it on a regional basis. And in Michigan, healthcare regions are broken up into a collection of counties. And I didn't want to necessarily uh, say one region was better and have someone from that county say, oh, great, we're fine, when in that county might have actually been a spike. Um, so this is the reporting that we've done on that. Um, now, the state did just release testing by county and date uh, about, a, about a week ago, and I'm in the process of working that up, and probably in the next couple of weeks, uh, or in the next couple of days, I should say, we'll have an updated map. But ultimately, the, the, the practice went from how bad is the coronavirus to what is, this, what is the state seeing enacting that policy? And so I think that's a real important um, um, 
factor in this at all is that ultimately MLI, I mean, there's, first of all, counties, uh, county health departments were reporting cases locally that oftentimes conflicted with what the state put out. Um, there was deadline issues. Sometimes they would catch something that was not right and they would pull it back, but they wouldn't let the state know. And we could have gone to all the counties. I mean, there's, you know, there's 83 counties in uh, Michigan, um, but ultimately we wanted to say, this is what the state is telling us they're using to make decisions. And that is ultimately the story that we were telling. Um, and then up here, this stuff right here in my, these are just highlights. Um, and, oh, in my opinion, um, they're not that informative. They give you a scoreboard. The deaths, is, it's a tragedy. And, it, you know, if you want to compare it to certain wars or whatever, you can see how it's impacted. But this right here really doesn't tell that much of a story because there's no context. It's just numbers that are going up. So anyway, that's my corona uh, spiel. I mean, there's also demographics that the state has been releasing. And if you go to the bottom, I'm not going to play these. These are two videos that quickly shows the spread, and that kind of gives an indication. But again, ultimately, with coronavirus, it's not – how many in a county, it's not even really how many in a county per capita, although that's a little bit better, but it's how many in a county per total testing of that county. And that's uh, one of the struggles that we have been uh, fighting for the last three months. Um, and then just to show you some other examples of visualization, um, uh, for anybody that was reading the news two weeks ago, two weeks, three weeks ago maybe, um, we had a 500 year flood in Michigan where a dam in Midland, Michigan uh, collapsed, became overwhelmed with rainwater and flooded the entire area shot down the, the river and the neighborhoods around it and then uh, didn't bust the dam, but overwhelmed another dam. And so we quickly got together and I've got the data on hazard rating, which actually was from the Associated Press. Their data, uh, they have a data portal and they do a lot of great work and they share out the data to subscribers. And I was fortunate that they did this uh, before the dam exploded uh, to have all of the hazard ratings for all of our dams in Michigan. We wrote a story on the high hazard dams as you know, bouncing off of the uh, Midland break, which was a high hazard, and allowed the data not only to be uh, shown the status, but in addition, the, the conversation went to, uh, should dams, are dams private or public, and should they be privately owned? Is the same standard of, uh, of uh, maintenance applied. They do have to go through rigorous uh, state and federal inspections, but that, also, that story also spun off. But again, if you don't want to search through all the map, you know, I was able to, this has got high and significant, you can pull it out and just have high. I also took all that data and uh, made a, took out the location, but allowed people to select dams based on their, their county that they knew they lived in and the ratings and uh, off of the conversation of should they be privately or, or, pub or government owned, uh, how they are owned. So that's another example of using a giant set of data, visualizing it in two totally different ways, giving people an idea that, oh, wow, there's a lot of high hazards around here. I'm, and, you know, this is a situation. Or how's my county uh, measure up overall? Um, and that's a lot of what I do is I'll take a big set of data and mapping it. You know, if you can add time and space to data, uh, it really gives context. Those are basically two pillars of it. I mean, there's thousands of variables, but. But, and then uh, present it to readers in a way that they can digest relatively uh, e easier than what I think was about uh, 10,000 rows of data. Um, so those are two of most recent ones. Um, uh, I've been doing a lot. This obviously isn't a poverty. And then they did ask me to uh, share an example of, of how data in theory would work out great, um, but didn't from, I guess, a web traffic perspective, which is one way we measure our success. Um, and that is about two years ago, we did a gigantic infrastructure series. Um, now, one thing I will say is that data visualization is, is uh, nothing without uh, a story, uh, a reporting, uh, a narrative, something that uh, will bring the reader in, get them the context they need. And then also then you ban, you hit them with the visualization and that allows it to really hit home. So this right here is a, as of two years ago, all the roads, bridges, dams, water systems and broadband. Uh, in Michigan based on a variables that, and it looks like a big mess. Now you were able to uh, pull out all of the, uh, the different layers and see it. And so each reporter that I worked with took a, a section of the infrastructure, used my data, used their reporting. We put up just the roads map for one. But when I put this entire map up with all of the data and uh, some introduction and of course some explanation about what it all meant, the, the, the map itself, which took tremendous amount of time and effort, uh, got very little traffic because people look at it and maybe they want to see their spot. Maybe they're not, maybe they're curious, but ultimately without a story supporting this data, they're really, they're just looking at a big mess and they don't know context. They don't know what to make of it. So 
ultimately, uh, my perspective is, and I work with about over, I don't know, 70 journalists, 70 reporters um, in MLive across the state. Um, they have a story that's got data. We get together, we work on it. They write and report, and then I will produce their data um, uh, that I receive. And uh, there's no bias or intent. Um, in fact, frequently I won't even read their story because I'm just trying to get the data out in, a, in an objective way that will then allow the reader to make their own conclusions. And then finally, real quick, just to give you a sense of how visual data can really impact. Um, so we did uh, just Monday, and this is where we bring it up. I didn't share this with you guys, with the uh, team. This is a population. We just, we're, we're kicking out a non-corona, non-flooding story. This is uh, Michigan's uh, population as of 2019 by the census. And if anybody knows Michigan, this is about right. The Southeast, the West gets the most. Most of this is what you consider rural. But then what we did, and this is the uh, key, and then I'll move, let, move on, is the, uh, we calculated the change in population. And green is an uh, increase and red is a decrease mm -hmm. from 2010 to 2019. And if that doesn't tell a story about the progress of Michigan over the last nine years, I'm not sure what could. I mean, there's obviously tons of variables involved, uh, particular census gathering. But ultimately, data visualization can quickly allow someone to digest a ton of information and make conclusions of their own, um, right or wrong. Uh, they'd have to read the story to see if it's supported. That's my, my spiel. Awesome. Thanks, Scott. Uh, before I kick it over to Emily, I just um, I had a handful of really quick questions. So the sure. first was, uh, and, and your work clearly is an example of it, but that I think people are crazy for interactive maps. They, every time we put an interactive map that has a good story to it, like people love it. So what is it? Do you have, what is it that people really like about that kind of, you know, data visualization? Sure. Well, I mean, I could get a uh, historical and say that, you know, the history of civilization has been built on moving across the world with maps. But ultimately I think what happens is that when a, when a reader, uh, is faced with a tremendous amount of text and numbers that aren't having a, con a context or comparison, which is very difficult to do in just text. Um, I think the ability to visualize it allows them, especially in this world where the internet is churning out thousands, hundreds of thousands of stories a day that they're exposed to, this gives them a really good context and concept of what all that data means. So in other words, if I said, you know, 50% of the counties in Michigan had negative uh, population uh, growth for in the last nine years and 60% had pops, pos, uh, positive. Um, you can say that's a great fact, but what does that really mean? How does it look? Where does it uh, suggest mm -hmm. the state is headed? This particular map that uh, with the population change, in my opinion, gives people a quick answer to something that if they want to dig in further, they can. They can certainly roll over every city. They can look at the clusters, but it ultimately, I think the mind uh, Processes visual uh, visual worked uh, in a different and maybe quicker, maybe slightly less complex way than it does with text. And uh, of course, we all live somewhere, and so if you see your home home or home city on a map, uh, you have a personal connection. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. That last part was the one I was going to note. Is that I think people really love to see where their community ranks on any given thing. Yeah, ranking so, is obviously significant in data visualization, even though it's just a number next to a stat. Yeah. The other thing that you mentioned uh, when you were looking, when we were looking at that last map, uh, you're saying like the map only works if there's a story attached to it, right? right? So you have to have both. And then it seemed like the other obvious thing was uh, that the clutter, right? If somebody, if a map is overwhelming, so you could have done maybe four maps, you know, or release sort of each layer at a time and if there was a story, people would have been interested in all of those things. Certainly, we've all been really interested in roads lately uh, um, and uh, internet and broadband. But Right, and, and that's actually, that was the, what we did. Uh, like I mentioned, each reporter took one of my maps, one of those layers, and yep. wrote a whole story, a whole thing. And those did so much better than just slapping it all on a page and saying, all right, go play with it. Um, yeah. I'm a site. All, this, all the metrics that they measure us by. Uh, which is fine. Actually, I prefer to support and um, improve our reporters' work. I was a reporter. Uh, I started out as a reporter. But um, the ability to enhance our product for the reader is uh, much more satisfying to me than just saying, here's all the data work I did. Scott Levin did this. Now go have fun. And I, yeah. and I report for MLife uh, occasionally, uh, more and more lately. Um, but uh, ultimately, I just like enhancing it. So telling yeah. a clear story, I think, is where it comes from. I want our readers 
to really know what's going on. There's so much misinformation out there anyway that for them to have the cleanest version of what we're trying to tell them is important to me. Uh, Emily, the upshot is really known for breaking down complicated data to explain politics, policy, and everyday life. So maybe tell us uh, the story of a couple of examples uh, when you've taken novel sources of data and tried to break them down in some of the ways that we've just heard about. Sure. So I'll, I'll just describe a little bit for starters how the upshot is structured because it's um, it's a really sort of unique and wonderful little team that we have inside the New York Times and there are not a lot of newsrooms who are structured this way. But so we're a small team of about a dozen people or so and we're divided pretty much half and half between people like myself who are more traditional writers who have a subject matter expertise. So someone who's who's beat is economics or healthcare or in my case I write about urban policy and all the topics connected to that. And then the, the other half of our team is made up of graphics editors and people who have really sophisticated statistics and data analysis skills, but also are very savvy about how we actually build things to show people uh, things with data. So many of the projects that we work on, the most ambitious things involve kind of mashing up all of this expertise together. So we're bringing kind of expertise in a particular topic like poverty. We're also bringing in kind of a statistics back Background. We're bringing in uh, a kind of graphics and visual background and putting all of those things together. Um, and the we're, we're kind of always thinking about uh, sort of strange new sources of data. Uh, and part of that is that we, we do a tremendous amount of work with kind of classic data that everyone will recognize that comes from the Census Bureau or that comes from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Uh, but we're always looking for sources of data that don't come from government. Uh, but that may that may come from the private sector, that may come from a company, that may come from a survey, uh, that would help get at questions that we have that government data alone can't answer. So, you know, we may be wondering, for instance, if there's data from an app that tracks people's runs through the park that would tell us something about who's actually using public spaces. Uh, we may be using uh, data from a private app that a lot of people use in order to manage their subway commutes in order to track you know, how traffic is changing or which subway stops are getting more or less traffic. Um, and so a, a lot of our work involves trying to think in really sort of creative and oftentimes weird ways about who might have data about this? And the answer to that question is just, uh, it's a list that is growing and growing by the day because now there are companies out there that are tracking what's happening in the housing market that are you know, being used to help facilitate your Uber ride. Um, there, just the, the number of companies out there that are sort of collecting data along the way, uh, not even necessarily sort of central to their company mission has, has grown and grown. And we've often found that if you reach out to those companies and say, would you share some of your data with us, even if you give it to us in some anonymized way, uh, a lot of them have been willing to do that. Um, so I thought what I would show you is a couple of projects in particular where we try to do something weird um, and, and, and both of which have, have to do with poverty in some sense. So this is, let me refresh it so you can watch it animate. So my colleague, Margot Sanger Katz covers healthcare uh, and she and I have sort of overlapping interests in the suite of programs like Medicaid, food stamps, TANF, uh, that, that have to do with, um, you know, kind of anti-poverty efforts by the federal government for low income people. And in particular, she and I are really obsessed with this notion of administrative burden. So this is the idea that we ask poor people to jump through all kinds of hoops in order to get access to different kinds of federal programs. Uh, and if you sort of dig down into the fine print of how these programs are structured, some of these hoops are really amazing. We ask people who uh, need access to food stamps to uh, make sure that they don't actually have lots of money tied up in assets. We ask them things like, uh, does your family own a bunch of burial grounds anywhere? Uh, what's the value of your car? Can you tell us how much money you have stored away in a bank account uh, that is earmarked for your child's Christmas presents? Uh, 
Uh, and these kinds of questions are incredibly invasive and they're also really difficult to answer off the top of your head. And they put this enormous burden on poor people uh, and, and we ask of them to sort of jump over all of these hoops that, that are much more significant than, for instance, what we ask farmers to do in order to get access to farm aid and farm subsidies. So Margo and I had this idea sort of based on our own life experience that, um, that we were terrible at a lot of the tasks that poor people are asked to do. So if, if you want to make sure that you don't get kicked off of Medicaid in the state of Texas, for example, uh, you have to make sure that if they send you a letter sort of checking in on your income status, that you open that letter and respond to it and mail them back a response and that they receive it within 10 days of them sending it to you. And, um, you know, how many of us have mail that we know is kind of important, but that's just sort of sitting on a pile somewhere in our house waiting for us to get to it? Well, if, if that describes you, uh, you would really fail at being a poor person who needs social services of some kind. So we we wanted to both sort of explain to people how administrative burdens work, but also cause our readers at the New York Times who are higher income to put themselves in the shoes of poorer people and think about what it would actually mean if your, uh, if your ability to feed your family or your health care for your baby were dependent upon your ability to do these various things. Uh, so there was not any data in existence that would sort of answer this question we had for us, which was sort of like, what, what share of all of us, including what share of high income people, uh, have really important mail lying around that they uh, are planning to get to, but, but haven't gotten to for the last week or so. Uh, so we, uh, we designed a survey, uh, which we put in the field with the help of a company called Morning Consult, uh, that ask people a bunch of really weird and random questions like, you know, do, do you have unopened mail in your house that's more than a week old that probably didn't make any sense to the people who were responding to the survey. But, but what we were trying to get at was uh, a sense of whether or not people could handle uh, various of these tasks. Um, and what, what you're looking at here in the presentation that we ultimately built is, is actually um, a slightly edited version of all of the mail that was in our colleague Kevin's drawer. Uh, things like medical bills he hasn't paid yet, uh, utility bills he needs to deal with. Um, he's a perfect example of someone who has a lot of this stuff accumulating who would really struggle if he were a poor person. Uh, and we actually photographed all of that mail and used it to, to build the, um, the interactive that's at the top of this project. But we, we really wanted to force readers to interact with these questions. And so uh, what we did before uh, showing you our findings and giving you the story is we gave readers a couple of questions uh, from our quiz to answer and think about themselves. So um, Luke, if you could be my guinea pig here, do you have paper mail you plan to read that has been unopened for more than a week? Yes, yes I do. Yes. Uh, and then we give you a, a statistic that comes from our survey. Uh, so 26% of Americans say this, and, and then we're sort of trying to tell you a little bit about why that matters. In some states, failing to open your mail and quickly respond can cost you Medicaid coverage. Uh, Luke, have you forgotten to pay a utility bill on time? At some point in my life, yes, I have. Okay. Usually. Uh, again, we give you a data point from our survey. We tell you a little bit about how this could get you into trouble in particular circumstances in this case, if you uh, have Medicaid coverage in some states. Luke, have you ever received a government document in the mail that you did not understand? Uh, yes, yes, I have. I'm actually surprised that it wasn't more than 25% of Americans who said yes to this? Yeah, yeah, that makes me think our uh, the government's doing better than we would have thought. Yeah, yeah well, it, I guess that also sort of points to one, one of the challenges with a project like this is that you have to think really, really hard about your question wording and making sure that people are sort of understanding exactly what it is you want them to respond to. Uh, have you missed a doctor's appointment because you forgot you scheduled it or something came up? <laughs> yes, yes, I have. <laughs> I, I'm I'm looking for one of these that I might say no to, Emily, and it's not working yeah. out for me. 
Yeah, I yeah, I should have uh, I should have put both of you on the spot there. <laughs> anyway, so so we just give you four questions and then the story begins, but then we also sort of have a little interactive table that tells you kind of here are some results from our survey alongside your own responses and then kind of the rest of the story is peppered with a bunch of responses to this survey. Um so so this I think is it it we were really proud of this project um in part because we were trying to get people to think about something I think most people have not thought about at all, especially if they're not low income. Uh, and, and I think we knew that we needed to do that in a really creative way. Um, but so, so this to me is just a good example of like trying to, trying to think in really strange ways about, um, about how you might get at telling a story with data and even creating the data yourself if you can't find a source of it anywhere. If, um, if I can just chime in for just one yeah. second, uh, one of the things that was occurring to me as you were talking last week, we talked about sort of shifting the narrative and trying to look at stories from a different perspective. And it strikes me that the administrative burden that you highlighted is in part uh, a response to a very strong narrative in the poverty discourse about the welfare queen and mm -hmm. how much we are concerned, deeply, deeply concerned as a country that somebody might get benefits that they're not actually entitled for. And I can say from my own experience, we just did, I work with the Department of Health and Human Services and we just did a big effort to expand access to food assistance for community college students and just reading through the regulations of them being ineligible categorically, unless they met one of 11 exemptions, which is very difficult for someone with a PhD to sort of make heads or tails of, is all because we're nervous that there's gonna be like one kid who gets through, who's, you know, uses the money to somehow get beer or something. So it's like you shifted the you you shifted the perspective of something that's really driven by narrative. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, we 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 very explicitly had in mind that the audience for this story uh, was higher income readers of the New York Times who had never been forced to think about this before, but who might uh, have some different ideas about poverty and anti-poverty programs <laughs> if we translated the experiences that those people go through into experiences that you would recognize as a middle-class or upper-income American. So one of the other things that we talk about in that story and that we surveyed a little bit about was people's experiences at the DMV uh, because that is a very universal experience of navigating government that's not dependent upon your income. And if you start asking people about their experiences of navigating the DMV, uh, everyone has these horror stories about long lines and you know bringing eight pieces of paperwork that are right, but the ninth piece of paperwork wasn't right. Um, and, and so if you sort of get people thinking about this thing that's recognizable and familiar to them and then say, okay, translate that experience to also what it means to try to be accessing food assistance and, um, you know, in, income supports to help you, you know, buy diapers for your baby and all of these other things. Uh, I think that that's, I think that that's sort of helpful. Um, it was it was helpful to our end goal, which was that we wanted to teach people something new. And obviously, low income people who live inside of this experience we were describing, we're not telling them anything they don't already know, but we're trying to get other people to look at them a little bit differently. Great. You want to take us through one more and then we'll yeah, uh, sure. get some, um, some so, questions. Um, let me turn my, my screen back on. Um, so one, um, this is a project that I worked on with my colleague Kwok Trung Bui, who's my frequent collaborator on lots of things and is a really, really beautiful um, graphics editor, uh, does great data visualization work. And um, he and I, we, we both share a lot of sort of interests in kind of the urban environment and how public policy kind of shapes the world that you see around you in cities. And um, we've been thinking a lot about this, this very, very niche topic that has actually been in the news a lot over the last year and a half, which is single family zoning. So single family zoning are these laws that say, you know, this entire neighborhood of the city of Washington, D.C. or the city of Detroit, nothing can be built here but large lot single family homes. 
And uh, you know, apartment buildings can't be built here, duplexes, triplexes can't be built here. And these zoning laws have this very long history of being used as an exclusionary tool to prevent uh, African-Americans in particular, but also low-income people and renters, more generally speaking, from moving into certain neighborhoods. So if you make it impossible to build an apartment building in parts of Northwest Washington, DC, uh, you basically ensure that lower income people who are more likely to be renters, who are more likely to be living in apartment buildings who can't afford a million dollar single family home on a large lot, that those people won't be able to live there. Uh, and and these, these laws have been in the news because a number of communities are starting to rethink them and just entirely get rid of single family zoning. So we, we had a question that we didn't know the answer to, which was what, what share of all of the land in various cities is devoted to this idea of single family housing, that nothing can be built here but a single family home. And we found uh, a company that provides mapping software that's primarily used by city governments to help them sort of do long range planning. Uh, and, and this mapping company um, and the software company was willing to share their data with us. And what they had contained in it was really, really fine grain parcel level data about what the zoning classification was for every tiny piece of land in dozens of cities. Uh, and we, what we wanted to ultimately show you was sort of exactly this, what, what I've put up here at the top. Uh, we wanted to show you a map of a bunch of different cities saying, here's all of the land where nothing but single family homes can be built. And here is all of the land where other things are allowed to be built. And uh, you, depending on where you live, these maps may jump out at you as being very familiar because in a lot of places, they are uh, very clearly overlapping with where pockets of poverty are, uh, how racial segregation is divided in lots of different cities. Um, and, uh, and, and so we so we put all of these maps up and we gave you sort of a single takeaway statistic at the very top. So uh, in the city of Minneapolis, for instance, prior to their enacting some, some change on this front, 70% of all of the residential land in the city was set aside only for single family homes. So, so here is an example of this very kind of invisible government structure that is uh, shaping people's access to, to good schools and to parks and whether or not you can live near your job. And we are trying to take this invisible thing and, and make it visible for you. Um, so, so very, very kind of obscure policy story, uh, but because we told it to you through these incredibly beautiful maps, uh, and, and we annotated each of the maps just to give you a little bit of a better sense about it. So for instance, you see these little stripes running south through Minneapolis. And what is that showing you? That's actually showing you sort of um, legacy zoning that ties to back in the day when there were streetcar routes running through the city. Uh, and, and, you know, we tried to be sort of thoughtful about giving a bunch of different kinds of cities and different geographic parts of the country. Uh, but but to, to come back to, um, the, the point that Scott was making earlier, uh, we very firmly believe that, um, that people love maps. And uh, in fact, um, at the Upshot, if you have a baby, uh, the team will give you an Upshot onesie that says people love maps on the back. So we can start indoctrinating you as early as possible. Uh, but anyways, we, but that, that's a, um, yeah, that's a vehicle that we come back to again and again because people connect to it so much. And sometimes um, you have to do something like dig through the zoning codes of a dozen cities in order to figure out how to construct that map. Wow. Uh, so riffing on that, let's say uh, I'm gonna take a question, sort of riff on a question from Daniel Basil. Uh, Scott, I'm gonna start with you. So um, what if I wanna get in on this action? What if I wanna start making maps and trying to tell stories. Journalists are sort of one group, but we we have viewers who might work for nonprofit organizations or scholars. What are some of the first steps? Like how do I learn to find the data? How do I how do I uh, how do I learn to map it? Well, um, like I said, I started as a reporter um, and got into the digital interactive world uh, about 10, 15 years ago. Um, <clears throat> and so I'm probably not the best uh, 
I didn't have the best trail. I basically was self-started. I will say that it is a lot simpler today than it used to be. Um, uh, there are, you know, hundreds of uh, resources online that you can use. Um, uh, there's a, you know, everybody's probably heard of Reddit and all of the sort of uh, underbelly uh, networks of that. But there is a Reddit subthread called Reddit Data is Beautiful, which pretty much got me started on what software to use. I use a, a mapping software called Carto, which is, I'm actually even scratching the surface of it. There's, they do spatial analysis and all this other uh, really high end stuff. I'm just usually mapping. But my advice, if you want to get it started, is to surf around on good uh, resources. Um, it, from, for my purposes as a journalist, um, I'm really interested in what uh, public uh, organizations, uh, government and other uh, institutions are using uh, to to move policy. A lot of their data drives their decisions. And so if they put it online, which most uh, state and local agencies are putting their data online, um, uh, you can download it and using some Excel formulas, which are very basic, and also a mapping software. Uh, there's, there's tons of them out there, not just Carto, Mapbox. Upload it and it will give you a fairly user-friendly interface on how to make it work. Now, I will say it did take me hours of, of work and learning. Um, doing it by yourself, it does lend to that. But uh, the last two newspapers I've been at were very uh, generous with my time, uh, or, you know, with their expectations. And so it was self-taught. And I believe as long as you don't have that sort of Zen uh, art of motorcycle maintenance line about uh, techno paralysis, paralysis in front of technology, I think you can pretty much figure it out mm -hmm. um, through those resources. Yeah. Hey, Emily, what about the other part of, uh, you know, so Scott's got us up and running on the uh, figuring out, you know, just getting to learn a, a, a program that'll help us with that. What about the thing that both of you do really well, which is find sources? Like, how do I how do I find that interesting piece of data that can fit into, you know, the map Scott showed or you mentioned uh, sort of going out and finding a private company? How do you sniff those folks out? Well, we it it's very rare that we produce a project from start to finish, like entirely within house by thinking about things by ourselves and playing around with data by ourselves. I mean, it is, it's almost always the case with, with both of these projects I showed you and with everything else I work on that I'm simultaneously doing very kind of traditional reporter work of, um, you know, oh. calling up, um, calling up researchers who I know study the topic that we're looking at um, researchers, are more familiar with data than, than just about anyone else. Uh, you know, reaching out to, particularly with issues of poverty, reaching out to kind of the social service and the nonprofit community, the legal aid community that works very intimately with those populations. Um, so what, what data have they looked at? What trends are they seeing? Um, can they help connect me to people who are experiencing these different things so that I can get a sense of what their problems are? Um, so it's a lot of, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a lot of very kind of old, old school work. It just happens to be that the things that I'm trying to sniff out are patterns that I know we can show you quantitatively in some sense. Uh, whereas other journalists who, you know, have kind of slightly different approaches or areas of expertise may be trying to, you know, sniff out the, the perfect anecdote that captures a trend story or something like that. Um, I, um, our, our ears always perk up when we're like, oh, that's an interesting idea and it can be told with data and we can visualize it and we can uh, find someone who has the data who will be willing to give it to us. We've got a question from Rob Burgess. Can you give an example when data has been used in a way that led to some inaccurate conclusions or misleading benchmarks um, or just, you know, the classic of mistaking a correlation with causation? Sky, you sort of had an interesting twist on this at the beginning with, um, you know, coronavirus cases and trying to contextualize that within testing. Um, I don't know if you want to talk more about that or if, if either of you have other examples. Well, um, yeah, that is that is a very good example. Um, I will say that uh, part of my job and the reporter's job is sometimes, um, let's say this diplomatically, sometimes the data that comes out, particularly in a uh, 
uh, government organization doesn't exactly have a data scientist behind it. And so what they're doing is they're throwing numbers at you that when you look at them a little more carefully, you might uh, take a pause. And there have been many cases where we have elected not to publish a certain data finding that they had. A really good example is um, the first week, and this, I'm sure they got complaints about it because it went away, is they started to report the death rate of corona by county. Um, but what they did is they just, I, I believe, I'm pretty sure they just divided the deaths by the cases. Um, and that uh, is misleading. Um, and so there are many instances, that's just one concrete example that pops up in my head. There are many instances where you have to be careful that what data is being given to you, uh, in, you you'll, you'll draw a quick conclusion to it, but if you give it a little bit of thought, uh, it's not going to be the conclusion that is true. And you can sort of put, especially as a journalist for over 20 years, you can kind of put yourself in the reader's position and see where they're coming from and kind of understand that they might interpret it that way as well. And that's misleading them to the point where it's, it's, a, it's a disservice. I can, I can give another example if that would be helpful. So, so this is a project that we published just last Friday where we were interested in um, what share of public spending in any given community is actually going to the police. So, you know, if, if we take everything government spends money on, including parks and sewers and housing and all of these other things, uh, how, how much of that goes to the police? Like how large of a priority have we been giving to the police and, and has that changed over time? Uh, and we found um, a really great data set from the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy, which had done some complicated things, standardizing data so that it's possible to compare, for instance, uh, the share of police spending in New York to the share of police spending in Los Angeles. And what we saw, because their data goes all the way back to the 1970s, was that this police share of, of local spending has been creeping up and up and up sort of consistently for 40 years. And uh, to us, this long-term trend was, was particularly striking because if you know anything about crime data, uh, crime, crime trends have gone like this really steeply downward in cities all across the country since the early 1990s. So we see police spending rising as uh, crime has declined. And to us, that sort of raises this question of like, why did we continue putting more and more money uh, into this public service when uh, it's, it's in some ways like less necessary than it was in the 1990s? Like we're, you know, we're no longer living in a situation where uh, homicide rates in New York City are orders of magnitude higher than they are right now and where your, you know, your odds of getting mugged on the subway are a lot higher. Um, and and there's, a, there's sort of a long literature which we looked at suggesting that, you know, no, it's not sort of spending more money on police that has made crime decline. But, uh, but a lot of readers responded to this story by saying, well, clearly spending more on the police has caused crime to decline. And uh, the liberal New York Times, you're inverting this narrative by asking, why did we keep spending so much money when it seemed less necessary? Instead, we should have written, uh, you know, the fact that we spent so much money uh, made crime go down. Uh, so, so that's an example where, um, you know, different people looking at the exact same data saw different things, uh, sometimes seeing the things that sort of uh, reinforce your own previously existing ideas. But I think on our part, um, we, we could have done a better job of preempting the notion that other people were going to see something in this data that we thought wasn't quite right and kind of addressing those mm -hmm. concerns mm -hmm. in the story itself. Like mm -hmm. oftentimes a lot of what we do is trying to think through ahead of time, um, you know, how will people critique this? What questions will they have? How will they push back against it? How is this going to confuse people's pre-existing ideas so that we can try to embed responses to that preemptively into the story as much as possible? Great answer. Hey, I want to get Fran Carr's question in. She writes for a small newspaper, uses a lot of graphics from large organizations. Any go-tos that you could recommend, uh, sort of places that she could be looking for great stuff to, to bring over? Um, are you, is it a question about software or uh, bigger organizations? Well, I think other people who are doing kind of the things you all are and uh, that she might look to sort of bring that content into her into right. her newspaper if she doesn't have the capacity. Right. Well, from my mind, the best free data visualization charting and graphing tool that's super user friendly is uh, data wrapper dot. I think it's D E. Hmm. Google it. 
Uh, they give you, I mean, I, I don't use it that much because we have uh, advanced publications. My parent company has a account with a different uh, cloud uh, visualizer, but um, yeah, datawrapper.de and then carto.com. I'll give them a plug. Uh, they're, they have a free product. You can do pretty much uh, basic stuff for free. So that, those yeah. are the softwares I could recommend. Okay. Okay, Emily and Scott, thanks so much for a great session. I learned a lot and had a lot of fun. I appreciate uh, the work that both of you do. And I wanna thank everyone who tuned in for uh, participating on YouTube Live and for sharing your insights and contributions. Uh, hey, we got another session coming up at one o'clock. So have a bathroom break, uh, You know, get a glass of water and be sure to tune in at 1 p.m. And uh, I hope you'll join us for sessions next week and tell all of your friends. Uh, we um, uh, will have everything up at poverty.umich.edu. All right, Emily and Scott, thanks so much. Yeah, Thank thanks. You. Bye.
Well, welcome back to The Poverty Narrative, A Midwest Perspective, a series dedicated to a deeper understanding of poverty in the U.S. and especially Midwest. I'm Lauren Slogter, a communications specialist at Poverty Solutions at the University of Michigan. I'm also a former journalist. Um, so some of you were here for this session right before this on how to tell a story with data. And uh, many of you may know that we actually kicked off this series last week. So our goal over the course of this series is to promote in-depth, impactful, and solutions-oriented media coverage of poverty-related issues. And so we'll be broadcasting live at noon um, every Tuesday and Thursday in June. And if you've missed any of our previous sessions, they are all available on our website, poverty.umich.edu. The series is supported by the Midwest Mobility from Poverty Network with generous support from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So today I'm really excited about our session on solutions journalism, which is the idea that it's not enough for um, reporting to simply point out social problems. Um, accountability journalism should also point to potential solutions. And I think this approach to reporting is especially critical right now as so many people across our country are seeking solutions to police brutality and really grappling with the best way to move forward and reopen our economy um, following the shutdown for the coronavirus. Um, so before we dig into this conversa conversation, um, just a few housekeeping items. Um, I wanna remind our viewers that we wanna hear from you um, and we'll be leaving time for Q&A in the second half of this session. So you can submit your questions in the comment box to the right on YouTube or on Twitter using the hashtag poverty narrative. We look forward to having a meaningful conversation and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. We welcome an open and respectful dialogue and want to let folks know we will be responsive to any inappropriate content in the comment section. So I'm thrilled to be joined today by Sarah Gustavus of the Solutions Journalism Network and Jean Friedman Rudowski of Resolve Philly, which is a nonprofit that backs a solutions journalism project called Broken Philly. Um, so Sarah is going to start us off. Um, she'll give us an overview of solutions journalism and also tell us a little bit more about herself. So Sarah, we'll uh, turn it over to you now. Thank you so much. All right, I'm gonna pull up my slides here. Um, I am Sarah Gustavus. I'm the Economic Mobility Manager for the Solutions Journalism Network. That's a new national initiative that we launched last fall. Previously, I was our Mountain West Region Manager working with newsrooms and journalists um, in the Mountain West region. And before I joined SJN, I worked for 15 years in public radio and television. I'm really passionate about solutions journalism and excited to share a very brief overview of, of what solutions journalism is. We have a ton more resources that I can share with folks after the session if you wanna dig more deeply into what solutions journalism looks like. So when we think about, as you said, traditional coverage of issues in communities, it really does focus on the problems and it focuses on crisis. I mean, these are some headlines that we're all familiar with, death, death disaster, destruction. Um, you know, we do need to cover the news of the day. We do need to cover when there's an emergency, when there's a crisis, but there's really been something missing, which is how communities are responding to problems and not just a crisis like a natural disaster or um, uh, here we have suicide bombers as one of the main headlines but things that are going on all the time in our communities, those things like poverty, that um, we're hearing from people that they are you know, tuning out to the news, it's too depressing. We've heard this from research by Reuters, the Associated Press, other academics around the US and around the world, that people are avoiding the news. And this is a headline from a report from Reuters, but I think we all know this too in just our own personal lives. Pre-COVID, when I would go to a party, people would often tell me, hey, Sarah, I know you work in uh, the media. I, the news is too depressing, it's too much. I just can't pay attention. Can you tell me what's going on? Well, that's really ineffective because I'm just one reporter, one journalist. I can't accurately capture all the news that people might need to know. We want people to have a more balanced 
uh, news available to them of both the problems in their communities, but the responses. And that's exactly why the Solutions Journalism Network was created, to spread the practice of rigorous evidence-based reporting on responses to social problems. This is very much journalism, not public relations, not advocacy. We're going to talk about that a little bit more uh, right now. So first, I want to define what is solutions journalism? What does it look like? There are four pillars of solutions journalism. First, it features not just a person, but a response to a problem and how it happened. These are not just stories about one amazing individual in a community or one great organization that's doing cool work. And those are good stories to tell. We're not saying that reporters should never profile an awesome community member, but it's not quite solutions journalism because it really stops with that person and the work that they're doing. And so if they stop doing that work, the response might stop with them. Solutions journalism, the second pillar is provides evidence of results, looking at effectiveness, not just intentions. I like to say these are not stories about nice people doing nice things in their community. Also, Solutions Journalism always talks about the limitations and avoids reading like a puff piece. And when we say limitations, we really mean limitations of the response, ways in which um, it's maybe not working for some people or it can only accomplish a certain amount with the way that their response is right now. It only addresses a slice of a much larger problem. Also, Solutions Journalism provides insights that can help others respond, not just inspiration. And part of the way that we provide insights, which I know can seem kind of vague, is to really tell our audience how the response worked. So the difference between a solution story and maybe a traditional story on a problem is that the solution story sets up very quickly in the beginning that there is a problem. And often solutions journalism works really well when the problem is known. Something like we know that, you know, um, there are kids that need uh, need free lunches in our schools. What's a, what's a way to get more families enrolled in that who qualify for it? And then walking through a process of how it worked um, and really spending the time with the response and less time defining the problem all over again. Often when there's problems that are known in the community, those things that are keeping us up at night or keeping people talking about year after year, we can very quickly remind people of what's at stake and we can spend a lot of time in our story on the response to the problem and what we can learn from a one particular response. Sometimes it's helpful to go through what is and isn't solutions journalism, what we, what we call the imposters. So solutions journalism is not hero worship. It's not, as I said a moment ago, about one person doing something great. And I often see these hero worship stories, particularly on Facebook. And this is something that I'm finding is really confusing for student journalists of saying, oh, yeah, this is solutions. This is about someone doing something. Well, not quite. So the story on the left here, Mommy Milk Factory, is a really interesting short doc that I saw on Facebook about a woman whose body naturally produces too much breast milk. And so she's donating it to families that need it. What's missing from this story is why she's doing that, why some newborns might need donated breast milk, what we know about the health outcomes for babies that have donated breast milk, why some moms might need that support. Also, you know, the evidence that this is working, who else is doing this besides her? It's just a story about one woman and all this milk in her freezer. Also, how do we know that this nice looking woman is not passing on diseases or infections to vulnerable babies? There's just a lot missing in this story that needs to be addressed to make it more than just one person who's trying to do something good. The story on the right Yes. Sarah, could I just interrupt you for a second? Um, I think we're having some technical issues. We're not able to see um, the this, this screen, the stories that you're referencing. Um, so if you could try again, maybe to share your screen so that we can see the, the two examples that you're talking about. Yeah. Sorry about that. To no, sorry. Real your train of thought there. Can you see them now? We are good now, yes. So yeah, maybe oh. you could um, just take a quick step back and and restart with um, the comparison that you were giving of the story on the left and on the right. Absolutely. I'm gonna start here with the four pillars and I'm, I can share my slides as a PDF too. So sorry about that technical glitch. I wish I'd known that you guys weren't able to see that. Um, so these are the four pillars and I can share this later, but this is the story on the left which is a story, a short video that I saw on Facebook and I just took a screen grab of it here about a woman who's donating um, excess breast milk that she has um, to families that need it. The story on the right 
is a more complicated story, but still includes, we, we don't want solutions journalism to just be dry stories about the facts of what's happening. We do wanna have people in the story that folks can relate to, that they care about, that are doing this work, that are actively involved in this response, but that the story, this story on the right goes much more deeply into um, the need for donated breast milk, why babies need it, why it's connected to health outcomes for babies, um, why some moms may need that support and how they're connecting the women who have breast milk to donate with families that need it, how they're ensuring the safety of babies and how this program, this is an example of a, a program in Brazil goes really deeply into how the response worked and then how other countries in Latin America were using the insights from that program to replicate it in other countries and what they were learning from that. So a more systemic response instead of just one person. Because a systemic response also involves lots of organizations, lots of different people in the community. It's not just about one person or one nonprofit. Solutions journalism is also not a theory. It's not think tank journalism. It's not the idea of, well, we think something might work. I'm a former legislative reporter. I covered legislatures and state government for many years. And I feel like I heard a lot of this when we were talking about ideas to address problems um, that lawmakers were considering. And so one way to really immediately do more high impact solutions journalism is to look for an example of it already happening on the ground. So the comparison here is a Brookings report about the idea of using media to encourage young people to make healthy choices and to improve their health versus a story of something already happening in Iceland, a program that has shown some success, what we know from that right now, how it worked, the lessons that other countries can use if they want to implement a similar response. So something that's happening on the ground. And I wanna say here that solutions journalism can come in at any point. It can be a response that's in the very early stages that's been going on for six months or something that's going on for 10 years. We just wanna be transparent with the audience about where the response is and what's known right now for evidence. And the evidence will be different for a program that's been going on for a year versus a program that's been going on for 10 years should have more, more evidence and more um, information to provide about how they're measuring success. Solutions journalism also is not magic bullet. And this is to be really clear that a solution story is not to say, we're going to present the solution to our audience. We're gonna tell our community what the solution should be to this problem that we keep talking about. No, we wanna look at a, a particular response in the context of there are many possible ways to respond to this. So we don't wanna see magic bullet, silver bullet kind of stories that this is gonna, you know, that the idea of, um, soccer balls, um, one program is gonna fix everything. And one of my favorite examples is Dawn dish soap. We've all seen the stories of Dawn dish soap being used to clean up birds and clean up wildlife after an oil spill. I mean, this has been great for Dawn. They use it in their commercials. There's often a lot missing in these stories about wildlife restoration after oil spills. So the story on the right mentions things like Dawn dish soap and the strategies for cleaning up birds after an oil spill, but places it in a larger context of wildlife restoration and what we know and don't know about how we're um, the effectiveness of different strategies for cleanup after oil spills. And we see this in stories about poverty. And right now I wanna give you a chance, knowing what I've said about the four pillars and what is and isn't solutions journalism, think to what you um, um, know to be some of the headlines and the focus of stories that you've seen about poverty in the past. If you could throw in some examples in the comments right now, Lauren's gonna read those for us. Yeah, if anybody has any examples, it can be um, a literal headline or just some of the language that you associate with headlines about poverty. Let's see what we, we've got from the viewers here. I can throw, while well, folks are thinking, I can throw out some examples. Um, I, uh, for many years, you know, have lived and worked in New Mexico, which is one of the poorest states in the nation. I feel like a lot of the stories about poverty 
um, are again and again focusing on how New Mexico's at the bottom. The constant narrative has been New Mexico's at the bottom. Every year the kids count data comes out, New Mexico's 49th or 50th. And there's really been an emphasis on how we are the worst when it comes to outcomes for, for kids. Um, also lots of stories about um, families are struggling, which is important. We're not saying don't ever cover stories about families that are struggling. But the narrative has been New Mexico's poor, New Mexico's kids are struggling. And it kind of stops there. Does anyone have any examples that's coming up for you and kind of your community? Um, I'm not seeing examples in the comments yet, but yeah, like I think of um, just a lot of focus on hardship and struggle, like you said, um, that that seems to be kind of the focus in a lot of poverty reporting. Yeah. I have a particular example I want to share because I just, I can't stop talking about it. It's the thing that just comes up for me over and over again about what we're trying to do differently with this economic mobility project at the Solutions Journalism Network. Mm -hmm. I have seen so many times, and I'm sure if I've noticed this, other people have too, these stories, really sad stories about people who are uh, walking to work in the middle of the night. They live in a place where they need a car to get to work. They don't have a car for some reason. And they are waking up at one o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the morning, and they are walking to work in the dark. And these stories are framed as like these heroic people. And they are, they're trying so hard and they are keeping those jobs and they are making it work. But what an incredible burden to have to walk to work at two in the morning. And so then these are the stories that you see about that. Their coworkers find out, people that they know in their community find out, and they buy them a car. I've started calling these, they bought them a car stories. <laughs> and it was really easy for me to find these headlines of over and over and over again. And I've seen the videos online. And it's so heartwarming, these people who desperately needed a car and their coworkers bought them a car, and that's great. But these are not solutions. These are not solution stories. This is an individual problem with, you know, their coworkers and their community stepped up to help them. But it's not something that can be replicated. It's not something that we can learn from and we can implement to address the very real transportation needs that workers have across this country. A solution story about transportation looks more like this from the Philadelphia citizen. Same problem. Workers in Philadelphia want higher paying jobs that are outside of the city. They don't have a car to get there. So how do they do it? The response covered in this story is van pools where people drive, they pick up people and they, they all get to work at the same time. And the story is all about van pools and how they work, how it was set up, who's using them. Great people in the story talking about the challenges that they faced and how van pools were helping them address that. There's evidence in the story of the number of people in the current van pools. There's limitations. Matching workers up in their schedules is challenging. And then you've got to rely on this group of people that you're driving with to work every day. And there are insights there about how to scale up this program in Philadelphia, how they're doing it right now, and how this can help workers meet demand at different companies and maybe get better jobs if they can say, hey, we can bring six people with us. We can bring eight people with us. We're ready to go. This is more of a solution story about the issue of transportation. And we can do this. And we're going to be working with newsrooms and with journalists over the next two years to help them do more of these kinds of stories. The stories about the challenges people are faced, how communities are responding. And this can be a solution from the government. Van pools are coordinated by a government agency, but it can also be grassroots responses of how communities are coming together. And that's the missing part of people are working together all the time to address the needs in their community. And there's not enough coverage about this important work that they're doing and what we can learn from it. So okay. some more examples. That, yeah. Did you need oh, to sorry, say go ahead? Word? Yeah. Uh I have some more examples of solutions journalism and how the, what these stories look like um, for the journalists in the room. And also, I think the researchers tuning in today will also see opportunities to work with journalists in these types of stories. So a positive deviant story. Journalists are so good at taking a, a data set, taking a report and identifying what's the worst outcome here. And that is an important story to tell. We do need to hold government agencies um, organizations accountable for things that are wrong. And that would be the story at the top is kind of the traditional story that a journalist would do. There's a report about cesarean births. We care about this because we're looking at maternal and baby health, you know, across the country. There's a hospital that has a cesarean birth rate, which has been tied to, um, 
you know, worse health outcomes that's higher than the statewide average. What is going on at that hospital and what can be done to address it? But often reporters don't go in the opposite direction and say, there's a hospital over here that has a much lower cesarean birth rate than the statewide average. What's going on there? Is there a story that we can tell about a response that can be replicated? Maybe, maybe not. We don't know until we get into the details of what's happening at that hospital, but it's worth at least looking, especially when you see a data set, and I've seen many newsrooms use this really effectively, of say, for example, schools, where the outcomes for kids where you wouldn't expect it, where you know there's a high poverty rate, the families are struggling at that school, but the kids are doing better than expected. The kids are doing better than average. There's often a response there that is something that can be covered in a really thoughtful solutions journalism piece. We also have lots of journalists that are comparing places. Maybe there's a response already underway in your community that you can cover, maybe not. If you wanna to look to another community and hold local officials accountable and bring in new information to your audience, you can go somewhere else and make a comparison of what have they done differently to get different results. This is an example from Erica Evans at the Deseret News. She went from Salt Lake City to Oslo to learn how they dealt with air pollution, which is a huge issue in Salt Lake City. And one of the great things things about this story, and I would encourage you to read it, I can send a link afterwards, is that Erica did a really great job of getting around what is often, you know, something we kind of roll our eyes when we see stories about Scandinavian countries and not to knock too hard on Vermont and New Hampshire, but often there are all these stories about, well, things are great in Vermont and New Hampshire and parts of Mass, you know, Massachusetts. Um, Erica did a really good job of explaining why uh, she went to Norway and she, she did consider other places and what was different about the geography and some of the political responses here. Also, she looked at efforts to encourage individual change and then systemic change led by the government. It's a really great story. Also, solutions journalism can very much be part of investigative reporting to not only report on you know, problems of what's wrong, but the real solutions and what we know about them for example, here, heroin and opiate addiction, we know this is a concern across the country. It's a known problem at this point. We do not know as much about treatment for opiate addiction and what's working and why and how those responses can be replicated across the country. For folks who are feeling a little skeptical, solutions journalism can also be instructive failure. It can be about a response that was expected to work and it didn't work and why. But the story when it's solutions journalism as an instructive failure really focuses on the, the actually how, how it was done in one place that worked, why it didn't work somewhere else. And this is a great example here in Colombia where cable cars were used effectively in communities to help people get around. They tried to implement the same strategy in Brazil, but they skipped some steps. They didn't do it in the same way. They didn't consult the community in the same way. And the outcomes weren't the same. And so it's an instructive failure story. All of these stories are in our story tracker, which is on our website. It's a great resource for reporters. It's a great resource for researchers and academics as well. You can search by location, by keywords, by um, type of response, by the type of media. There's lots of tools here that you can use to identify how people in other places are um, covering the same issue. Often people ask me, isn't solutions journalism just good journalism? Absolutely, it's just good journalism. It makes our reporting stronger and more complete. It tells the whole story. And I wanna pause here. In this moment that we're in right now, we're hearing, you know, journalism is really, people in journalism are talking about the ways in which we have not covered communities well. And one of the re things that I think of often is I worked for a Native American owned media company for several years. I've done collaborative work with Native journalists for many years. And I can tell you, Native communities often don't trust journalism because their community has been covered as a problem, exclusively as a problem over and over and over again. Reporters have not come in and said, what are the ways in which the community is working to address this problem? And they are. There's incredible grassroots initiatives. There's incredible work being done in tribes to address the exact problems that journalists see. Things like um, you know, depression and youth suicide things like diabetes. Um, there's a lot more there that could be covered. Solutions journalism is an incredible framework for doing that and for beginning to build trust. It's not rebuilding trust, it's building trust. We can tell the whole story of communities in better ways using solutions journalism. It's also definitely a way to strengthen accountability. Problems that were seen as unavoidable, especially by officials, start to be seen as unacceptable when we show that other communities have taken 
have used different strategies and gotten different results. And it's not advocating, it's not being prescriptive, it's just telling the facts of what and how they did it in another place so that people can learn from that, they can use that information to make decisions and have local conversations. We're also investigating problems right in front of us, the things that are most important for our communities. I'm gonna quickly run through some of the why, what we're learning about um, how we're addressing the problems I said earlier about people tuning out from the news. We believe that solutions journalism is crucial because when we omit critical information necessary for society to create change, uh, people don't have the information that they need. We absolutely need to be covering responses to problems as well as problems. It's the missing key point of journalism. We're not saying avoid problems and never cover them, but to also cover responses is important. We're finding that it engages people. We've worked with researchers across the country to look at how people respond to solution stories, time on page, reflections afterwards, that this fresh approach to stories that's often dismissed as too depressing brings people in in a new way. Solution stories are more likely to be shared on social media and people are reporting back that they feel more powerful and less likely to tune out when they read a solution story. The Seattle Times has had a long running project called Education Lab. This is some of the data from uh, their own internal review of their solution stories, an increase in page views, increase in time on page, huge jump in social shares, and in people coming back to Education Lab to read that great coverage of responses to education issues across Washington State. If you're a reporter, how do you get started doing solutions journalism? These are some key questions that we encourage you to ask. The first one, who's doing it better? And who's doing it better can be very, very local. Who's doing it better in one school or one neighborhood in your community? Who's doing it better in another city, in another state, maybe even another country? Those are all opportunities that's up to you and your editors, you know, your newsroom to decide what's the best way to approach this story right now for our local audience. How does the response work? This is what sets solution stories apart. They are really about the response, not 90% problems and a tiny you know, bit of the response at the end, but really, really digging in deeply to the response throughout the entire story. Also ask what metrics matter. Uh, metrics, you know, this is in, in the idea of evidence. This is something reporters and I debate a lot, editors and I debate a lot, like what evidence is good evidence. And it really depends on the story. It depends on the available evidence. So it's something that you need to wrestle with. There's not one answer that we can give as SJN about the metrics and evidence that matter. But one thing that I found really effective in my own reporting was to ask the community how they were measuring success, to ask tribal leaders what success looked like to them, how they knew that success, you know, that they were moving forward. And those are great things to include in your story. Who is the response not working for is really crucial so that we don't oversell that this is a response that could be used everywhere. There might need to be uh, it might need to be adapted. It might need to be changed. It might not be a response that works for every member of the community. What does the research say and what do the critics say? And is this response being replicated elsewhere? And what are the barriers to replication? I often think too, um, I work with a lot of reporters who they're very focused on what's happening in their local community and just pausing and saying, is this happening somewhere else? Gives them you know, more resources, more potential sources, more ideas to bring into their story to make it even stronger um, just by taking a step back, looking around their state, looking around their region to find out who else is doing similar work. And remember, uh, we're not overclaiming or predicting the future. That's what makes this strong journalism and not public relations or advocacy. We're painting the full landscape as much as pos possible, contextualizing that this response is one of several possible responses. Uh, and there's reasons why maybe you're covering it now. Maybe it's been going on the longest. There's more evidence. It's timely because lawmakers are talking about it right now. Uh, also make your story about the idea behind the program. The program is just the illustration. These are not profile pieces. Remember back the solutions journalism imposters. And we're gonna tell our audience about limitations. We're gonna be trans as transparent as possible about what we know and don't know about the response right now. These are two stories I love to leave folks with. Uh, who's doing it better? We can always ask that. Solution reporters can be asking their sources, can also ask in their uh, planning meetings who's doing it better. And not every story is a solution story. 
But we think it's great if reporters and editors uh, and journalists are asking themselves all the time, is there a possible solutions angle to this story? It just gives you an opportunity to tell those important um, solution stories. That's my email. I'm happy for folks to follow up with me afterwards and look forward to your questions. All right, great. Thank you, Sarah. That was very informative and I'm sure it was really just scratching the surface. So I would encourage people to head over to the Solutions Journalism Network um, website and learn more about um, all the work that they're doing. I really liked um, what you were talking about with um, just how Solutions Journalism can help to build trust with um, communities that may have um, historically been reported on as a problem. Um, and so, Jean, I wonder if that might be a good transition to you just to talk about how um, Broken Philly has changed the relationship um, between journalists and the community in Philadelphia and just how that uh, project has evolved. Yeah, thanks. Um, and it's great to, to follow Sarah. Um, Resolve really actually grew out of the Solutions Journalism Network um, and we're still, you know, good friends and allies in, in the work that we do. Um, so I am Jean Friedman Rudowski. I am the co-executive director of Resolve Philly. Um, I'm gonna share my screen and just go straight into um, the PowerPoint and then hopefully have some time for questions at the end. Uh, give me one sec here. Okay. Can you guys can you guys see my screen? Are we good? Yep, we've got we can see our presentation. Great. Okay. So um Resolve Philly is an organization. Um, we are developing and advancing journalism built on collaboration, equity, and the elevation of community voices and solutions. So um, we are a journalism organization, but not a newsroom. Um, and Part of what we do, um, as as Sarah referenced a little bit, and um, Karen did as well, we um, we run Broken Philly, which is the largest ongoing collaboration um, of uh, newsrooms in the country. So, a little bit of background: Philadelphia. I mean, Sarah talked about New Mexico sort of being at the bottom when it comes to um, tallies statewide. Philadelphia is the largest poorest city. Um, in the United States, poverty rate hovers around 25 to 26%. That was pre-COVID. This is from a couple years ago. 48% um, of Philadelphians cannot make ends meet, right? So um, this is folks who half of our city are dealing with severe economic hardship or in instability. Um, so, you know, the poverty numbers themselves don't even tell the full picture. Um, so this is kind of the background as to why we created Broke in Philly. It was 2018, it was coming off the heels of a really cool sort of journalism experiment that was run by SJN, where we got 13 newsrooms together in Philadelphia to cover the issue of prisoner reentry. It was called the Reentry Project. Um, from a solutions-oriented perspective, we had 13 newsrooms who did collaborative reporting over the course of a year. Um, and after that, the newsroom said, let's do this again. Um, and because of that centrality of poverty and economic hardship being um, being yeah, really at the center of you know the lived experience of the majority or close to the majority of Philadelphians, we decided to make poverty and economic mobility the focus of um, uh, of our next project. It is now 24 newsroom partners. This is everyone from NBC and Telemundo to the Inquirer, WHYY, to very small um, Spanish language only radio stations that have one staff person um, and everything in between, niche outlets, other ethnic media, community media. Um, we have published 739 articles to date. It is a five year long project. So start in 2018 and we'll go until 2023. Our role, just for a little bit of background, um, we these are folks that are on staff for us. So we have a project editor um, that oversees the project. Um, I was that editor until the end of last year. Um, now it's being run by um, my colleague, Andre Nata. And then we have a couple of other shared resources, uh, community engagement editor, investigative solutions reporter, and a data impact order editor. Um, the reporting is happening among the newsroom outlets, and then we call it together on brokenphilly.org. Um, and, and through these shared resources, you know, we support the newsrooms in various ways so that they can do better um, solutions and collaborative reporting. 
So a couple of examples of what solutions journalism on economic mobility looks like that is very much intentional um, to strike out the poverty uh, because, you know, there's there's a lot of ways to reduce poverty and or to reduce a poverty rate of a city, right? One would be gentrification and driving people out of the city. And that is not what we wanted to focus on. So thinking, you know, really switching the frame, thinking not so much about poverty, but about economic mobility. Another reason for that is sort of that stat going back at the beginning, a quarter of our residents in Philadelphia live in poverty, but half of them are experiencing economic hardship and are in desperate need of economic mobility. Um, so that's what we try to kind of hone in on in the work that we do. Um, it's funny that Sarah used a Philadelphia Citizen article. It's also a go-to for us. Um, they're a great outlet and they do almost entirely solutions journalism. So this is a pretty um, classic piece uh, of Sojo. Um, it has all of those four elements that Sarah talked about. Um, how it works, the limitations, the takeaways, um, and really kind of hits on the key elements. And it looks at how um, financial coaching um, is actually is actually producing real results. This is examining something that was working in Delaware, and there is an organization in Philadelphia that is bringing it to Philly, and it's just talking about you know that that research and that data that really shows that this um, that this uh, type of program works to push uh, economic mobility. Uh, this is another uh, article that, that is, you know, kind of a core solutions piece um, that's come out of the, the work that we do. Um, can evictions be avoided? Landlords and tenants are negotiating over Zoom. This is from very recently. This is a little bit more in the realm of what Sarah was talking about sort of earlier on, right? The, the previous piece that I just mentioned, um, it was, you know, it's a program that had been running in Delaware for years. There's a lot of research and a lot of data that shows whether it's working. Um, this is one that's just being started. So the emphasis on the piece is a little bit more on the, on the how. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's showing good results, but the reporter was very honest about the fact um, that, you know, it's being tried and yes, there are good results, but, but we have yet to see kind of um, whether it's going to be effective over the long term. But it's important to report on things that are being tried in the beginning so that others learn about them and maybe, um, and maybe they can, maybe they can grow. Um, this is another one, and this actually gets to, you know, the question that was asked um, to me when I started this presentation of you know changing changing relationships between journalists and the community because yeah it's you know to say that we've lost trust I would say is even um, is is being a little bit kind of too kind to journalists because in a lot of places we didn't have that trust to begin with particularly in communities of color um, and so this was an awesome series that our partner our newsroom partner Green Philly did. Um, looking at Hunting Park, um, which is a majority black neighborhood, um, a lot of families with, with very low incomes. It is often cover, covered because there is crime, because there are drugs, all of the reasons that journalists often descend on um, communities experiencing poverty. And this really does the opposite. It, it goes in there and looks at um, the ways that people are in the neighborhood are taking it upon themselves to green their neighborhood and to green their space. And this is, you know, it's, it's one of my favorite examples because um, even with solutions journalism, sometimes you can still get the sort of um, outside savior program. So folks coming in from the outside running an effective program, and that's great. But this is, I think, kind of um, a... a hopefully increasingly being used form of solutions journalism where people who are directly affected by the problem are leading that change, right? It's what Sarah was talking about in some of the, um, the native communities, the indigenous communities where she's done reporting for a long time. It's what are people on the ground already doing and how can we elevate that um, so that the narrative about those folks experiencing poverty can really, can really be changed. Um, how can help spur impact? Uh, so, Pretty soon after Broken Philly launched, um, a reporter named Mara Ewing did a story that was actually, um, it was between The Appeal, which is a national publication, and Philadelphia Weekly. Um, Philly Weekly's site is being redesigned and anything older than a year you can't see right now, so I couldn't get a screenshot of the Philly Weekly publication. Um, but this was, it was in some ways a traditional investigative piece where Mara had found out that the city of Philadelphia um, when people would 
uh, would post bail when they were arrested and they would post bail. Even when they showed up to their court date or the charges were dropped, the city was keeping 30% of their bail funds, even in a case of mistaken arrest, right? I mean, imagine that you are mistakenly arrested, the charges are later dropped, and you know, your friends and your family put up bail for you, um, and they uh, and you can't get all of that money back. So she wrote this piece, you know, sort of exposing that, which was excellent, and then added on the solutions angle because the, you know, the complaints or sort of the feedback she was hearing from the city was, um, well, you know, we need it. We, you know, we're struggling financially. This is an important part of our revenue stream. So Mara actually looked at how in New York there were those same kind of pushbacks, but they actually found a way to to give everyone um, their their bail money back. Um, and so she included that in the story. And so it speaks to what Sarah was saying. Of it takes away those excuses by saying, well, yeah, but if they can do it here, why can't we do it here? Uh, sorry, if they can do it there, why can't we do it here? Um, so this story came out. Um, it was because it's a collaboration. It was posted on many other um, sites throughout Philly. The Inquirer wrote an editorial. She was interviewed on WHYY and Word Radio. Um, and about two months later, no, I'm sorry, actually, it was a couple of weeks later. Um, the uh, judicial court um, changed its ruling about this. Um, and actually now all everyone's bail money gets returned 100% if they comply with the conditions. How it connects to research. I know we have a lot of researchers in the room, so I really wanted to make sure I um, hit on this point. Um, Research can be incredibly useful um, in solutions journalism, not just because you need to rely on data. Um, you know, you need to sort of show some evidence and 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 show some data when you're doing really good and transparent, honest solutions journalism. But on, but also because it can really um, just add huge layers of nuance to your story. So this is from Next City. Um, they wanted to do a story on. Um, asthma rates in, in Philadelphia, you know, connections between essentially health outcomes and economic inequality and race. Um, and Philadelphia is in some ways one of the worst, but they reached out to a place called, um, sorry, I thought it was in here, but it's not, uh, a little bit later, Journalist Resource Center, um, which is an excellent organization. If you guys don't know about it, they call research for sort of for use for reporters. <laughs> so they do kind of a lot of the grunt work of reading really dense papers and pull takeaways. They provided um, a whole bunch of um, analysis about what's actually working in asthma prevention, particularly when it comes to communities that have a lot of um, low income, uh, families with low incomes and experiencing economic hardship. And so it was built into the piece, um, the not just sort of why not just kind of pointing out the connections of the problem, but what actually works. So a couple takeaways for researchers, because um, Sarah did a lot of you know, excellent learnings for journalists in the room, and I wanted to speak to the other portion of that audience. Uh, the first thing is, you know, I, I was a journalist, I was a freelance reporter for 10 years before I, um, before I started doing this work. Um, so, so I know the dynamic of, you know, you're focusing on a problem, you call a researcher who has studied it, and you ask them a million questions about the problem that you are focusing on in your reporting. Um, if you are a researcher, you know, any reporter most likely is going to at the end say, you know, is there anything else you'd like to add that they didn't ask you? And that is always an opportunity to say, hey, you know, there's actually a ton of great research and a ton of great data and evidence about responses to this problem. Can I talk to you about some of it? Can I send you some of that afterwards? Just to sort of, you know, put out there that even if someone doesn't come to you doing a solutions piece, you have the ability to push them in that direction by making them, you know, by offering them some material uh, to be able to um, to really take that that solutions component and run with it in their reporting. Um, Another one is know who's on sort of the poverty or related topics beat and reach out to the reach out to them. You can be proactive too about data sets that you have, um, especially on issues at the center of public discussion and when those data sets link to solutions. Um, we have actually, go back one sec, we have an excellent example of that. Um, we did a story uh, again with Philadelphia Weekly that our data and impact editor worked on. She looked it over, um, 
the Reinvestment Fund here in Philadelphia, um, which is an organization that does public policy and data analysis um, and, and some funding work. Um, they had been collecting data on evictions for the past 10 years in Philadelphia. Over, it's a data set with over 200,000 evictions logged into it. Um, and so we, they reached out to us and offered us this data. And we were able to go back and do um, a lot of work to analyze what that data meant, to then do a story that was published um, with Philly Weekly. That really, you know, that data really took the story in a new direction because it gave key insights as to why the evictions were happening. Um, a lot of which was what were what are known as retaliatory evictions. So people were calling licensing inspections on their landlords with a problem, and then they would get an eviction notice. And without that data, without someone having come to us and say, "Do you want all this data? Do you want to analyze it?" We would never have been able to to work with Philly Weekly on that story. And then another is, you know, knowing and connecting with the Journalist Resource Center. They're a really excellent resource for us as journalists, and I think can be for you as researchers, um, because sometimes it is hard to kind of know how to take your research and be able to frame it in a way that seems like an interesting story for journalists, um, and they can help with that. Um, they can help just by, you know, knowing what you're working on and, and putting together one of their roundups and, and sending it out. This was the um, the eviction story that I was uh, referencing, where it where it showed that there was a lot of retaliatory uh, evictions going on, and this is the the journalist resource center, and that's how um, a lot of the asthma reporting ended up happening. So that's it. I I will get to um, I I want to say one other thing, um, and this goes to kind of the the trust issue uh, that. Sarah was talking about um, right at the end. I think, so I noticed um, at the very beginning, you guys mentioned that, I'm um, just gonna stop sharing my screen. We're just, uh, we can't see your screen right now anyway. So okay, great. You're good. <laughs> um, excellent, thanks. So um, I heard at the very uh, beginning of the, the previous section that Sarah Alvarez from Outlier Media um, spoke last week um, for those of you who didn't see that session, I would highly recommend it um, because anything, anytime Sarah speaks, it is worthy of paying attention. And I'm sure that she made the comment about how a lot of the reporting that happens around poverty happens about folks experiencing poverty and not for them. And these are two very, very different kinds of reporting. So when Emily was talking in the last session, session Emily does tremendous work at the New York Times. Um, the, the quiz that she was referencing of, you know, could you could you make it as a poor person? Or I think that was the something like that as the title. That is for people who have never experienced poverty and and want to understand what that might be like, right? And that is very, it is important and valid reporting because there are a lot of us in our lives who have never had that experience of severe economic hardship. Um, but I would dare to say that that the majority of the reporting that happens in the poverty space is um, is geared towards that audience rather than to actually the vast majority of Americans that either currently or at some point in their in their life have experienced um, serious economic hardship, and really thinking about what is reporting that is valuable to them in their lives. That's what Outlier Media does, right? They provide excellent. Um, information access around um, utilities and now they're doing stuff around COVID to folks experiencing economic hardship. And it's something that we think a lot about um, when working with our newsroom partners and really trying to push them in that direction of doing reporting, not just, not just about poverty, but really for people who are experiencing that hardship and thinking about what are their information needs and how can we address those. So I will leave it at that. All right, great. Thank you very much. Um, in our last few minutes, I did want to um, switch to some questions from viewers. Um, one of our viewers, Megan Airgood, um, is interested in the community engagement editor position at Broken Philly. If you could just um, maybe talk a little bit more about that person's role and, and the significance of that work. Yeah, so this is um, Derek Keene, who is um, excellent. He joined our staff actually uh, a couple of days ago. It was his year anniversary on our on our staff. He was our second third hire um, after my co director and I, Cassie Cassie Hames and I. Um, his role is really to be trying to bridge that gap between 
um, communities in Philadelphia that has, have historically felt misrepresented or underrepresented or you know outright harmed by the media in Philadelphia and the newsrooms that we work with. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that he goes about doing that. Um, it was very uh, in-person heavy work um, before COVID happened. So he would host things called sound offs. He would in libraries all around the city, um, in historically misrepresented communities, he would have community conversations um, without journalists there just to talk with folks about their experience with the media um, and 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 try to kind of give, give people a place to kind of sound off about how they're feeling and then take that back to the newsrooms and, and have conversations with them. Um, We've continued doing sound off works and now happens uh, sound off events and now happens over over Zoom. Um, they're sort of topically f focused. So um, Derek himself is a returning citizen. He spent um, many years uh, in prison and um, and came out uh, three years ago, I guess. So he does a recurring one with other folks in the reentry space. Um, and it's it's conversations. It's a folks. It's a it's a place for people to um, talk about what's going on in their lives, and then we're able to take some of that understanding and that knowledge and pass it on to partners, both for reporting they can do, and also just you know to be thinking about in general how they cover certain communities. He's working on um, also a, and this is sort of still kind of in the planning phases, but trying to put together kind of a, a code of ethics um, and what it would look like for um, for community members to create a code of ethics that could be offered to newsrooms um, to sign on to or not um, but to but to say these are these are the ways that we'd like to be treated this is the language that we'd like um, to have used when you're reporting on us et cetera et cetera so that's a little bit of his of his work okay I really like the idea of having that code of ethics um, to just communicate those those expectations to reporters. Um, another question from a viewer, Fran Carr. Um, can guests talk about how their organizations are funded and just what that looks like, um, how you get support to do your work? Uh, Sarah, do you want to start? Sure, I can start. Uh, so SJN uh, doesn't do any original reporting. We support newsrooms and journalists through grants and training and workshops. Also staff, uh, in my role, we have region managers that uh, work in kind of an advisory role of providing, you know, feedback and resources and connecting folks to things we have at SJN. We receive funding from foundations for various aspects of our work. Uh, Economic Mobility is a Gates funded project. We're seeking out some additional funders, but they're our primary funder for our economic mobility work at the moment. Yeah, and we are right now almost entirely um, funded from philanthropy, um, mainly from foundations. Um, we know that that is not sustainable. Um, we're a very young organization. 